We're going to talk about how to use your VA benefit to buy your first or next real estate investment. This is the first step. Then we're going to dig into how you can use this to scale, how I use house hacking to scale. And we're going to really crush through this webinar and help you guys get through buying your first house, your next house, using those houses to leverage, essentially achieving financial freedom, which is wonderful. So I promise you're going to get something out of this no matter where you are in your journey. And if you don't get something out of this, hit me up on Instagram with whatever you wanted to get out of this. And we'll talk because I'm all about helping you guys get value. So this is what we're going to dig through. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the overview here. I will let you read that when you can look at this cool picture. Uh, this is, man, this might've been like probably like six months after my EAS, maybe 10 months after my EAS. So that's me, the ugly one with the hat. Uh, and then my buddy, Victor, who's a retired Navy Lieutenant commander and my buddy, John, who was my roommate in California for a long time, recon sniper, um, you know, all the good stuff. And we did a 56 mile, five day trek to Machu Picchu. And it was awesome. If you haven't been to Machu Picchu, I encourage it. Super cool location. So we're going to dig right in. These are what I believe, what I hear with my Facebook group, the most common myths about the VA loan, right? Number one, we've all heard it a million times. You can only use the VA loan once bogus. I'll tell you a story later on about how that screwed me. But for right now, just know that's not true. You can use the VA loan multiple times. I've known someone who did it four times um, at the same time. Like he had four VA loans out at the same time. Now, number two, there's a limit. Okay. True and false. There is no longer a limit on your first use or when you have full entitlement on how expensive a property you can buy. For example, my buddy Matt bought a $2.5 million house, zero down with the VA loan. Now, as a Lance Corporal, you're not gonna be able to afford a $2.5 million house, zero down with the VA loan, unless you've got something going on in the background that none of us know about, in which case you should be running the show here. Matt has a very successful seven figure business, so his income was able to qualify for that. That being said, after your first use, there becomes, it goes to the county loan limit for your area. And we'll dig a little bit further into that. But on your first use or when you have full entitlement, zero limit, you can go as high as you want, zero down, as long as your income, credit, all the other stuff qualifies for that specific loan. Now, number three here, you can't rent rooms or units. In fact, some of y'all in my comments on the ads I was running for this, I got ripped up on this. People were like, you can't live in that or you can't rent out the house until you lived in for one year. You can't rent out rooms and you've lived in it for two years. Here's the deal. You can rent spaces in the house the moment you buy the house. You just have to also occupy. So if you buy a five bedroom house, you can rent four bedrooms out and live in one. If you buy a fourplex, you can rent three units out and live in one. You can also rent three units, two bedrooms out and live in one bedroom in the last unit. There's a lot of combinations here, but you can rent stuff the moment you buy the house. You just still have to meet the occupancy requirement to do it. We'll dig in a little bit more as we go. Number four there, you need two years experience as a landlord in order to buy a duplex. No. The VA guidelines actually say you have to have a reasonable chance of succeeding as a landlord in order to, you know, buy a duplex. And, and, and what it's, it's actually not about buying the duplex. It's about using the tenant's income to qualify for the loan amount, which we'll dig into in a little bit. So I would argue that any veteran who, you know, is not a, like, not a felon, whatever, you know, even then, whatever, any veteran who is qualified for the VA loan is reasonably has a, has a reasonable chance of succeeding as a landlord. Now, some banks won't see it this way. That's not the VA, that is the bank deciding otherwise. In that case, what you do is you hire a property manager, they come in and say, we've got the experience, you're good. Okay, that's like the way around that. Uh, you can't use the VA Earl unless you live in the house. The Earl, we'll dig into it a little bit, interest rate reduction refinance loan, incredible product. Not true. As long as you still have a VA loan on the property, you can use the Earl no matter what. So we had a buddy who, I had a buddy who did this twice in properties that he didn't live in anymore and they had tenants and he was able to drop the rate during the 2021, you know, 2020, like low interest rate bubble and uh, super cool benefit. We'll dig a little bit more into that as well. And then number six, disability doesn't income doesn't count and the GI bill income does. So BAH with the GI bill does not count towards qualifying for your mortgage. And the only reason for that is that the bank knows that income is guaranteed to end in the near future, you know, three, four years, whatever, one year, however much you got, time you got left. And so they're not going to count that as income because they know it's going away. Disability income on the other side, other hand, does count 
towards qualifying for that loan. And it actually counts at 1.25 times whatever you bring in. So if you bring in $4,000 a month in disability, so 100%, um, then they will actually count it as $5,000 a month because it's not taxed, which means you would have to make $5,000 a month taxable income to come out to the same amount of untaxable income at 4,000. So hope that makes sense. All right. This is kind of my quick journey. We'll just briefly, we'll talk about some of these, but I bought a house hack duplex in 2015. I got stuck on base housing in 2016 because I didn't understand how to go over the, you know, current limit in Hawaii, missed a big opportunity there, but I, you know, I got to live in a nice house on base. No big deal. 2019, I actually rented a house in which I rented out bedrooms and was still able to live for just about free, even though I was renting the space and I didn't buy it. And I wish I had bought it. 2021, this building that I'm in right now, the upstairs, I currently have a tenant in right now, an Airbnb guest that checked in tonight. They'll be here through Saturday and they're paying my mortgage. So I rent the upstairs, which is a four bed, two and a half bath house. And it pays me around 3,500, 4,000 a month in Airbnb income. And then the downstairs is my office. It's a two bed, one bath. And then behind the house, I have a tiny home that I use as my studio for myself. And the Airbnb covers all of the expenses here and just a little bit of income on top of that. So I get to live for free. And then I plan to do, uh, to build a barn dominium in the future, but that's down the road. We'll use that with the V. I'm gonna talk through some of the advantages with the VA loan for house hacking. The first is that it's zero down. Now that literally means zero down. Now that doesn't mean zero out of pocket guaranteed. There's a difference. Zero down is if you're buying a hundred thousand dollar house, if you had to put 20% down, that'd be 20 grand. And if you had to put 0% down, that'd be zero grand. Um, there are still closing costs and fees. Normally you should budget between one and 3% towards closing costs and fees. So that would be like your inspection, your appraisal, uh, the origination fee, uh, the title insurance with your title company, the title search to make sure that you actually are buying the house free and clear and it has a, a clean title so that nobody can come back and say, no, I still own that house. Um, and all those things. That being said, you budget between one to 3%, depending on your market, your agent should have a better idea for that. And then the VA loan allows you to get up to 4% of your purchase price credited back towards your closing costs. So let's say you budget $3,000 on that same $100,000 purchase price. Your seller can gift you four grand towards your closing costs, which would cover all of it and you'd be good. And then you'd actually be zero dollars, not 0% down, but $0 out of pocket to buy a house. I actually have friends who've been paid 500 bucks at closing, a thousand dollars at closing. That is not the norm, but it is possible. So here's the thing with this. It all depends on the market. If the market is like 2021, where everybody's bidding a million dollars over asking price, you're probably not going to be able to negotiate with the seller to give you 4% back towards closing costs. If it's stable or going down, you will be able to. The alternative here is you offer a little bit higher to get that 4% back. And as long as the uh, appraisal justifies it, then you can do that as well. So again, working with a quality agent will help you with this. So number two here, 75% of gross income, rental income counts towards your debt to income ratio. So debt to income is basically the difference pre-tax between the income you bring in and the mortgage, what the mortgage, the debt is going to cost on that house. So in like an FHA loan or a conventional loan, you have to be below 49% debt to income, meaning your mortgage can't be more than 49% of your income to qualify for the loan. The VA loan doesn't have a minimum. So I've seen people in the 70, 80% debt to income range. I think 78% is the highest I've seen. I've heard of 82%, but that's still outrageous. Um, being approved. Now, again, so what this means here is if you're buying a fourplex, let's say three of the units are rented for $1,000 a piece, then you can take 75% of that, i.e. 750 a unit or $2,250 for all three units every month and count it towards your income. And I'll show you a slide in a minute to kind of break that down, but, it, but suffice it to say this, you can qualify for a more expensive fourplex than you can a single family because you'll have more income coming out of the tenants to add to your current income, which allows you to qualify for a higher loan. This is a really cool benefit. Um, one of those leases, if you're buying a fourplex, needs to either one of the units either needs to be vacant 
or they need to be moving out within 60 days of you of you purchasing the home because you still need to plan to occupy it as your primary residence. So if you if they're all on one year leases and they don't expire anytime soon, the VA is going to be like, well, you obviously can't move in here because you have tenants. But if one of them is a month to month lease or expires in 45 days after your closing, then you're fine. And if you do use the 75% rule to help you qualify, in that case, you'll need to have up to six months reserves somewhere. That means if your mortgage is $1,000 a month, you would need to have $6,000 saved in order to use the 75% gross rental income. And my, guys, don't get wrapped around the 100,000 and the 1,000 and all these smaller numbers. I know some of you are in expensive markets at a zero or, or whatever. I'm just trying to make the math really simple so that you kind of understand the concepts as I go through a lot of information tonight. This works. In fact, I would say it works better in expensive markets than it does. It, it works the same. It works fine in either market. There are some advantages to affordable markets. There are some advantages to expensive markets. We can talk about that a little bit later if you'd like. Um, suffice it to say, it'll work anywhere. And also worth noting, if you have a, thr a thrift savings plan or an index fund or a 401k or any of that, that money will count towards your six months. So if you have 10 grand sitting in your TSP and you need 6,000 to qualify for it. All right, there's no PMI, which is the uh, private mortgage insurance. So if you, if you buy a house and you pay less than 20% down on any loan other than the VA loan, you're going to be required to pay what's called private mortgage insurance. You'll actually be required to pay a mortgage insurance premium up front and then PMI every month until you get past that 20% down. So to do the math down here, uh, the PMI on, I bought my first property was $79,900 and my PMI was $81 a month. So roughly a hundred dollars a month for every hundred thousand dollars that you borrow, not cheap, right? A hundred thousand dollar mortgage might be like, four or five, 600 bucks, depending on your interest rate. So you're adding like 20% of your mortgage payment in just PMI. Contrast that with the VA loan, you pay 2.15% uh, of a funding fee wrapped into the VA loan. And there are some ways out of that. I'll cover that in a minute. So assuming that we're at a current like 7% interest rate, that's $14 and 30 cents added to your payment every month for every 100,000 you borrow. So again, I don't know about you, I'd rather pay $14 and 30 cents a month than $100 a month for every 100,000 I borrow over the course of the loan. I promise you the funding fee is a better deal. Also, if you're currently serving and you have a Purple Heart or you got out of the military and you have at least 10% disability, funding fee is waived, right? So, and you can restore your entitlement. So there's two ways this works. There's a one-time restoration of benefit. I'm gonna just repeat one time so that is once uno one time because this get this one gets confused all the time if you still own the house so if you refinance your va loan into a conventional loan you can one time you can restore your entitlement if you sell the house you're back to zero you've got full entitlement so what that means if i buy a million dollar house with a va loan and i sell it i can buy another million dollar house with va loan if I buy a million dollar house with a VA loan and I refinance it into a conventional loan, then I can do a one-time restoration of benefit and I can buy another million dollar house with a VA loan. Now, if you go for the third one, you won't be able to do that again until you sell both of those original properties that were purchased under the VA loan, including the one that you refinance. Because at that point you're stuck. You've already done the one-time restoration. But if you sell one and refi and sell one and restore and sell one and restore, you can do that infinitely. You can also own multiple homes under the VA loan as long as they're under whatever your county loan limit is. So this is what I was saying. The first one doesn't matter. The first one, you can buy a bajillion dollar home as long as you qualify for it with the VA loan zero down. After that, your loan limit will come into play. I think the minimum right now is 750 and it goes up to like 1.1 million depending on your market. So if you bought a $350,000 house and you're going to buy another $350,000 house, you're good. You don't need to refi. You don't need to restore entitlement. doesn't matter. But if you buy a million dollar house, your next purchase, you're probably going to need to worry about that. That being said, it gets kind of complex on all of this. So there's always a lot of questions about this. I'll give you guys a link at some point here. You can go ask my lenders a question and they'll answer it just to help you out. And I say my lenders, they're just the lenders that I trust and I work with a lot. I don't, I don't own a loan, a lending company. Okay, 
the EARL, the Interest Rate Reduction Refinance Loan. Basically what this is, is it allows you to drop your interest rate. Basically no questions asked. This is incredible. No other mortgage does this. You can drop your interest rate on a loan without doing another credit check, without income verification. So you could literally, you could buy a million dollar house at 7% interest. If rates drop to 4%, you can use the VA EARL, drop your interest rate, even if you're now jobless, have no income, got divorced and you ruined your credit, like you're just totally screwed financially, you can drop the rate. And the reason for this is the VA assumes, hey, if you made your last six months mortgage payment at 7% interest, pretty sure you're gonna be able to afford them at 4% interest. Like we're making the loan cost you less money, no brainer. I love this because it's a hedge. Right. So like right now when rates are high, you can buy a house and if rates go up, you already locked in your rate. But if rates go down, you can use this and lower the rate. Win win. Now, here's the benefit with this. You are not allowed to do the VA Earl if you don't meet the bottom requirements there. You have to recoup all of the costs. So like the the fee, right, because you have to you have to pay to do the titles or the um, you have to pay for the new appraisal. You know, you're gonna have to pay the fees like the origination fee for the new loan. If you don't recoup all of those costs in 36 months, so what I mean by recoup is, let's say you save $100 a month on your mortgage. You would need to save 36 months worth of that $100 needs to be more than what the loan costs. So if doing the EARL costs you $3,000, and which they can wrap, by the way, costs you $3,000, then you'd be good because you make you save $3,600 in that first 36 months. So as long as you meet that bucket and it's at least a half an interest per, like a half a rate lower loan, you can qualify for the VA Earl. So they won't even let you use it unless it actually helps. Okay, two more real quick. A lot of people don't know you can do a renovation loan. So the FHA 203K loan is what a lot of people are familiar with. That's like a 3.5% down and you can buy a fixer upper, renovate it, then move into it and you've got a nicer house. The VA loan does the same thing, but it's 0% down. There are a lot of lenders who will tell you this don't exist. Doesn't exist. That's just because they, as their bank, probably doesn't do it. But it is a thing. There are banks that do it. Happy to make introductions for you. And with the VA loan, there's no hit to your interest rate for buying a multifamily property. So if I buy a fourplex, let, let's say I'm qualified for a five, a 7% interest rate with a single family house. If I buy a fourplex, with an FHA or conventional loan, that 7% rate will automatically go to 7.5 or 7.75. It'll be higher automatically because they have a higher interest rate for multifamily units. Not the case with the VA loan. So for the VA loan, you'll have a lower rate on a multifamily than you will on a non. I told you I would break this down real quickly. This is showing basically that let's say you make $7,200 a month. And again, I asked a lender in California to help me with this. So don't judge me on the numbers because if you're in Missouri, you're like, oh my God, a million dollar triplex. Like you're right, they don't exist out here. Um, but if you make $7,200 a month, you'd be qualified for a $600,000 single family house. If you make $7,200 a month and then you have $2,600 in rents coming in from your duplex, after you take the 25% out, so it's 75% of that 1,950, then you qualify for a $800 duplex or $800,000 duplex. So basically this is showing you like, based on counting in those, the 75% of the rents for the units that you're moving, that you're buying, you can qualify for larger. So like you could buy a, theoretically a $600,000 single family house, you might qualify for a $1.2 million fourplex, just based on the rent that you'll be able to bring in from the other three units. I should mention a couple things here. That's long-term tenants if it's airbnb they can't count the income because they don't know how to do it like it's so variable so you got to base it off what it would bring in long-term tenant wise and also it's market so if you're if you've got like really low market rate tenants you got to go and say hey this is what the market rates are and i'm going to move it up to that or if they're vacant you got to figure out what the market rates are by talking to a property manager but long story short if you make you know $1,000 a month off those other units, you can bring in $2,250 a month towards your income. Or in this case, let's say that fourplex has $8,500 would be the rent of those three units. Then you'd be able to bring in 6,375 of that 75% to, to add to your qualifying income. So you'd actually go in with $13,575 a month 
as income. And that's how you qualify for that larger principal interest taxes and insurance. By the way, pity is just your mortgage payment plus. Okay, here's some just quick breakdown using the VA loan. We're using a $420,000 property for these average for these numbers because that is the current average price in the US. So if you're like me and you live in the middle of nowhere, Missouri, probably lower. And if you're like half of you and you're in Camp Pendleton, sorry, that's a small number. Um, so it's zero down. That's great. That could save you between $14,000 and $84,000, depending on if you use an FHA or 20% down payment. So anywhere from that three and a half to 20%. The PMI, we talked about this already, but it'll save you between 2,100 and 6,300 a year, depending on where you fall in that range. And then closing costs, if you get the 4% credit, you're not paying those. So that could save you between 4,200 and $12,600. So you're gonna save just by using the VA loan between $21,000 and $102,900 in year one by using the VA. Now, a couple things to remember, you'll probably have a better interest rate. That'll save you money. Also, you're going to save the PMI. So that $2,000 to $6,000 a year, you'll save that as well every year. So for the next 30 years, you could save two grand a year or six grand a year, maybe not 30 years, because assuming at some point you'll have more than 20% equity, you'll go get the PMI removed. But at least for, for the next five or 10 years or longer, uh, you'll be saving two or 2,000 to 6,000 that the other person won't be. Plus you'll have a better interest rate. So VA loan, now, I told you we're gonna talk a little bit about house hacking to get all, all this started. So house hacking is essentially, this is where you buy a property and you're renting out other spaces. That's really all it is. So this could be you buy a big single family house, you're a, you're a young pilot and you buy a five bedroom house, you rent four bedrooms out to other single young pilots. And the five of you live in this house and you probably party too much and you have a great damn time, you make awesome memories and also you're getting to live there for free as the owner and your tenants are getting ridiculously lower rates because you're probably gonna charge your buddies a discounted rate so that they save some money so it's worth moving into the house and then you're still gonna make money on it. Win-win, I'll show you an example of that. And then the other option is you buy a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex, you rent out other units and then you do it, you live in the one unit and you're living for free off them. Now, those aren't the only ways to do this. You can 100% put a tiny home in the back and rent that. Put an RV in the driveway and rent that. Build an ADU, an additional dwelling unit, and rent that. Find a way to chop your house from a single family to a duplex and rent that. Build an ADU in the garage and rent that. Or you can do any of those versions and live in the garage, live in the tiny home, live in the ADU, live in the RV and rent the house. All of that is totally okay. The name of the game here is getting other people to subsidize your rent so that you save money because the faster and more you save money to reinvest, the faster you achieve financial freedom. I'm gonna break that down here in a little bit. It's awesome. This is why I love house hacking. First things first, your primary residence mortgage, that's the, you know, whether you use the VA, the FHA, the, con the um, conventional, or even like the physician's loan or a, a USDA loan, like there are other products, but they're all better than an investment loan just the way it is. Investor loans are way more expensive. I remember in, let's call it 2017, I bought my 10 unit and my interest rate on that 10 unit was like 5.75% interest. And I know that sounds great right now, but my interest rate on my house that I bought around that time frame was like 3.4, 3.6, something like that. So it's like a solid 2% cheaper. So like right now, we bought, we bought properties not too, like a month ago, we bought 13 single families on investor debt and the rate was like nine and a half percent, maybe maybe even higher. It was like nine to nine and a half percent, something like that. Whereas you could buy a primary right now for under 7% probably, depending on your rate um, or, your, or your, your personal financials, right? So just pointing that out, primary residence mortgage, cheaper interest rate, it's a 30 year mortgage instead of a 25 year mortgage, which also lowers the payment, just a better option. And then you're gonna to get to benefit from cash flow, which is money in your pocket, or if you're not cash flowing, even just saving the money that you would be paying to live somewhere else. Depreciation, which is just a fancy word for tax benefits. I'm not gonna dig way deep into the depreciation side of things right now, because that's beyond the scope of this presentation, but tax benefits. You're gonna get debt pay down, meaning your tenants are helping you pay the mortgage down and you get to keep 
the money that goes down on your principal over time. And then appreciation, the property going up in value. Beautiful thing about real estate, if you had $10,000 and you put it in the bank and it earned 6% interest, then that $10,000 would be 10,600. Then it would be, you know, you do the math. But let's say you have a $100,000 house. That would be $106,000. So instead of earning $600 on the 10 grand, you'd earn 6,000 on the 100 grand. Same return. Now, properties on average go up around 6%, but let's say it's 3% right now, I don't know, whatever. On average, over the last like 40 years, it's been closer to 6% that properties have gone up in value nationwide. The best part about that is if you put zero down on a house, you're earning that 6% on the value of the home and you didn't invest in the value of the home. The bank gave you the money for it. Bank gives you $100,000, then that 100 turns into 106, you get the 6,000. It's great, and that compounds. You also get to avoid analysis paralysis because it's safer to buy your own house. And what I mean by this, when you go to buy a home, everybody loves it. They're like, oh my God, the American dream, go you, woo, white picket fence, whatever. When you go to buy an investment property, and I'm telling you from this experience, or from experience, people are gonna be like, oh, invest rentals are scary. There's tenants and, and toilets might go out. You might have to change a light bulb at 2 a.m. and all these horror stories. By the way, I've never fixed a toilet or changed a light bulb at 2 a.m. in the you know nine years I've been investing in real estate because I hired a property manager. But they will try to talk you out of it because it's scary to them or they have a horror story or they heard something or landlords of the devil or whatever. With house hacking, you're not buying an investment property. You're buying a house that just so happens to have tenants to help you pay down your rent. So you're getting a less scary way to buy your first property as an investment because you're living it in any way, which takes almost all of the risk out of this compared to buying an investment. And you get to learn how to be a landlord, learn how to deal with tenants. You get all the other benefits. It's phenomenal. And you're increasing your savings gap. So what do I mean by that? You've got to pay $2,000 a month to live somewhere anyway. I'm just making that number up, right? We'll say like San Diego, right? To San Diego would be like $3,000 a month. But let's say you gotta pay $2,000 on rent right now. If you can then instead pay zero because all of the people you're house hacking with are covering that $2,000, you're getting to save two grand a month that you would have had to spend somewhere and you're still getting the housing. So that's $2,000 a month that you can now go invest. And I'll show you how that works here in a minute. There are some downsides. I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you this, and I'm, I'd like to fancy myself as not a liar. First off, I'd like to point out, in this photo, these are all people in the war room at a Bigger Pockets event, there's probably close to $100 million worth of net worth there, all service members and vets. There's a recon guy who owns like 15 Dairy Queens in the photo, there's a another guy who owns a bunch of apartments and used to run the podcast for Brandon Turner, uh, one guy built his first Airbnb and he netted a million dollars on the rent, on the refinance and he owns the house for zero money out of pocket and it cash flows. Um, there's a guy who runs his own jujitsu company, like there's some crazy stuff going on in that photo, so just shout out to them, they're awesome. And then here's some of the downsides. You live next to your tenants. That might be annoying to some of y'all. Now, I think that's less annoying to us than it is to civilians because we've been living in the barracks or base housing or whatever. Like we've had all of those. Like we're not, it's not, it's not weird for you to live next to other people. Your tenants might know that you own the home and that would be annoying because they might come to you with problems. Personally, I would avoid this by hiring a property manager. So then when they come over and they're like, oh, the landlord's such a jerk. He did this instead of you being like, oh, that's me. I'm the landlord. You could be like, oh my gosh, I know. Tell me about it. He's the worst property manager did this to me the other day. You're not lying. You're just not admitting you own the house. It's the property manager's problem. That's why you hired him. Location might not be perfect. You're probably not living next door to Shaquille O'Neal or Michael Jordan. If you're buying a fourplex that you're renting out to tenants, right? It is what it is. There are some ways to get into really nice neighborhoods though, but it might not be your dream home. That's fine because this is your starter home for changing the trajectory of how fast you achieve financial freedom. This is like, if you've ever seen those graphs and it's like, if you invest this much, your return will be this. And if you invest this much, it'll be like this. That's what you're doing. You're making that pivot to make a higher return going forward on your money to achieve financial freedom that much faster. Also, it can be hard to let passive income be passive. I remember my first duplex, the tenants, 
they were section eight. They had all these sob stories for things, whatever. But they had a tarp. They had like this blue tarp that they would like take uh, like broom handles and like poke it up in the air over the little porch. So like this makeshift like duct taped together broom handle tarp covered porch. And it looked terrible. And it used to drive me nuts. And I used to stew over it and ask my property manager. She'd be like, it's not illegal. Like they're not breaking any rules. Let it go. And it would drive me nuts. When I finally moved out of the house, problem went away. Now they still did the same thing, but I just didn't know it because I didn't live next to them. So it's like, just try to ignore the things that don't actually cost you money and just deal with it. Okay. So here's the Barney style operations order. And this is where I show you some of the money. So let's say you house hack and then you relocate. You house hack, you PCS, you house hack, you PCS, you house hack, you invest, whatever. Right. I love this. So in that very first house hack after year one, let's say you're saving $2,000 a month. Now the number there, that's me saying you probably, we're just using the two grand. Let's say you would have needed to spend $2,000 to live somewhere. Well, because you're living there for free, you're effectively saving that same $2,000. By the way, that's post tax two grand. So it's the equivalent of saving $2,500 or it'd be the equivalent of earning 2,500. All good. After that first $1,000. Pretty sweet. After year two, you did it again, $48,000. After year three, that first house is cash flowing $500 a month. So you moved out, you rented the first unit or the unit you had been living out of. Now all your costs are covered. And let's say you're making $500 every month in cash flow, plus $2,000 a month at the next house. You bought an identical property, identical numbers. Never happens, but you get the point. So now you saved $6,000 that year from the house hack cash flow plus 24,000 from the one you're living in 30,000. So you went from 48 to 78,000 in year three, same thing in year four. Now you're up to $108,000 saved. Then you do it again. Now you've got two properties cash flowing at 500 a month. So that's 12 grand saved that year. Plus the 24,000 you're up to 144,000. Cause that's 36 grand that you saved in year five and year six. Now you're up to $180,000 saved. And that is just in money that you would have been paying to live somewhere, plus the cash flow from the previous years that you started. That first house that you've owned for six years has probably gone up, according to the national average, 36% in value. So if you bought a hundred thousand dollar house, that's another hundred or another thirty-six thousand dollars added to your net worth. That second house has probably gone up twenty-four thousand dollars according to the national average. So that's sixty thousand dollars between the two of them added to your net worth. And that third house. Oh, this is after six years. So there's still two years in that one. So that's probably another 12,000. So you're probably up to 72 grand. You count that in, you're at $252,000 saved plus appreciation and equity, not including all of the rent, the principal that your tenants have paid down, not including all the mortgage payments that have been made. So if you count equity, you're probably over three or 400 K in value in this homes. And of course, that's also not thinking that Back here, I'm going to do this. I'm not supposed to do this. Let's see if we, we don't break the machine. Let's say after year three, you have $78,000 and you take that and you go put a 20% down payment on a $300,000 house. That's 60 grand out of pocket, bought a $300,000 rental property, 18 grand in reserves. Cool. So now that you've got a fourth property in the mix. So there's, this is why I love this strategy because it's like, dude, you could easily have four five, six houses right now. If you did nothing else but the house hack and take your savings and invest them along the way, no crazy stuff and you can do crazy stuff. So that's how this can change your life. Hope some of you are paying attention. This is my first property. I wish I'd never sold it. I sold it two years ago. This was probably my favorite rental. Um, not really, but it was, it was one of my better performing assets for sure. Bought it for 79,900. It brought in 475 in that first year. Cause I had a tenant. My mortgage was 585. So I was out $110 a month while I was living in it. Keep in mind before that I'd been paying 550 a month to live in an apartment. So I was really saving $440 a month to own this duplex as opposed to renting the apartment. When I moved out, it paid me 250 a month. All right, that's cool. So let's say I get that 250 a month for however long. So at the sale, the rents had gone up. I refinanced, so the the mortgage was a little higher, but it was bringing in thirteen hundred a month, still around two fifty a month in cash flow, and I sold it for one sixty five. So I netted seventy five thousand two hundred dollars on the sale price. That's not including like I took out my agent's commission before that. 
I made around $17,000 over the length of time that I owned that property, which is, I think it was six years. Might've been closer to seven, six or seven years. And so I netted a total of $92,200 over the time that I owned that property. And I put 4,000 into the property, right? Cause I actually used an FHA loan on this. Cause remember my agent or my lender told me you could only use VA loan once. Don't waste it on this house. So I used an FHA and then I did some flooring and I painted one of the porches. So I was about 4,000, maybe $4,500 all into this place. And it made me $92,200. Pretty sick. House hack breakdown numero dos. This is the house I'm currently in. I bought this for 365. My income about 3250. That's from the Airbnb. Now it's sometimes it's higher. It's been higher lately, but not always. And then my mortgage is about $1,700 a month, or it was, this was when I first bought it. I actually, it was making 925 a month. I actually refinanced this guy out of that loan during my divorce into a investment loan. So my numbers are actually worse right now and I'll show you that. So I did a cash out refinance. I pulled out the money I put down on this. I put about, I did a 5% down conventional loan when I moved in because the bank told me I didn't qualify for the VA loan at the time because I'd quit my W-2, but that's a whole, whole different story about how the mortgages work. I didn't show income. So even though I had like $7 million worth of mortgages or $5 million at the time worth of mortgages, um, it's different to buy your own house. It's kind of funny. So I put 5% down and I used a conventional loan. And uh, when we cashed, when we refinanced that, I pulled all of that money back. And so I, I have no money left in this property at this point in time. And then it cash flows like, 2,500 bucks a month, right? Now, honestly, that's that's my real number from last year. Last year, I made like 300 and something dollars, like $303 last year in cash flow. Not great. This year, it's doing better. So this year, it'll be it'll be more than 25 a month. It'll be like three or 400 a month. But I haven't sold it yet. I've still made 11,700 in cash flow. I made 2,300 bucks when I refinance. So I've made about $14,000 owning this home. But the home has gone up in value. I bought it at 365. It appraised for 425 last year. So there's 60,000 there. And then I live in a six bedroom, three and a half bath house that I can like, I've got this badass porch. When I don't have guests, I go entertain, right? And I have a free office. It covers my office. It covers where I live. I live for free. I love this strategy. So here's a couple things you should be looking for in properties, right? If you're gonna dig into this strategy, I would recommend you look for a single family bed house that's four bedrooms or more. So whether that's a four bed, three bath, five bed, four bath, or six bedrooms and four baths more, all right? Now those are big houses, but I'll show you how that works is like a single family house hack in a minute. I'll give you an example. And the reason I put the bathrooms there is you don't wanna buy like a five bedroom, two bath, or a five, six bedroom, two bath, which they do exist, but they're weird. You wanna buy one that's got a fair enough amount of bathrooms that people aren't gonna feel crowded because it'll make it, it'll increase the value of rent that you can bring in. Or you wanna look for a duplex, triplex, fourplex. So two, three or four unit multifamily property. Personally, I would go fourplex if you can because it gives you more wiggle room on everything. As market rents go up, you'll be able to increase rent. If one tenant moves out, you'll still have two tenants to help you cover while you get a new tenant. Um, Lots of other benefits to having the four units. I wish I'd bought a fourplex for my first property instead of a duplex. I mean, I would have made an extra $80,000 most likely when I sold it and it would have been sweet. It would not have cost me much more to get into that house. Obviously, you know, it's not like every fourplex is better than every duplex. The, every deal has to be underwritten them their own way. But generally speaking, fourplex is better than twoplex or duplex. Um, then I'd look for like a single family house or a multifamily where you could build an ADU or add a tiny home or something like that. And in any of that, if you can find one that needs renovations and do the renovation loan and add value and build equity into the home, that's even better. So these are like what I'd be looking for. And I would basically hit up an agent and say, yo, these are my criteria. Find me something that makes sense. And if you got a good agent, they'll help you with that. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So why so much talk about house acting? It's honestly my absolute favorite strategy for service members and vets. And I think it's the best place to begin your journey because it's the fastest way to change your trajectory because you're saving the most money. Most rental properties will make you a few hundred, maybe a thousand dollars a month in rent, you know, which is great. But if you can just immediately cut your entire living expense and then also potentially do that, 
definitely better. It's simple, right? House hacking is not some crazy complex strategy. It's very easy to repeat. This builds the base for those bigger risks. If you've got your living expenses covered, now you can afford to take a few more risks, which as long as you play your cards right, calculated risks will help you achieve financial freedom faster. This is gonna give you confidence too, because you're buying a house, you're proving it works, you're getting proof of concept. This is what sent me over the edge for my financial journey. Had I bought a single family house, I might've gotten into real estate, but when I bought the duplex and I lived for very close to free, and then I moved out and it was paying me, I was hooked. It was off to the races. And then it's applicable to everyone, right? No matter where you are in your journey, you can find a way to make this work. Even if you've got a huge family and you don't want to house hack a duplex, you can rent an RV or a tiny home or an ADU or something, or you can you can find duplexes or fourplexes that are like three bed, two bath, or four bed, three bath. I've seen four bedroom, three bath, fourplexes. So you can find them. All right, so what's next? Now that you've got this dialed in, you can start scaling. You can really start to push towards that freedom, right? You know how to analyze a deal because you've done it. You've run the numbers on several to find your first one. And you probably got hooked enough that you started doing it for practice. Now you know how to buy real estate. You understand the whole process because you've been through it. You know how to manage a rental, or at least you found a good property manager to manage a rental for you. So you've learned that part. So it's not scary anymore. And you're saving capital. That's the money. You're saving $180,000 in six years strictly for investing. Again, don't get high from your own supply, guys. Like, don't Say, ooh, we're saving two grand a month. Let's spend it on a new car. Like, no, 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 no. That's your money for financial freedom. Put it somewhere that earns interest, like an index fund or high yield savings account, and keep saving it to buy your way into financial freedom. That's the trick here. That's the discipline. So now it's time to do more and to do better. You find other deals. You find better deals. You find better lead sources and analyze more deals. That could be local investment groups. That could be wholesalers. That, there's a lot of ways. And you'll learn all of this as you start digging into the journey. You're going to find better, better lenders. There are better lenders. Like my local lender is incredible. The stuff he lets me do, most banks aren't even thinking about allowing, which is awesome. right? So I can get into deals for lower down payment than most. I can buy deals that most banks wouldn't lend on. Like I can buy an RV park and a lot of banks are scared about that. Um, and then you can learn about creative financing. So that 10 unit I mentioned, I was able to use creative financing on it. And that's something you just, we can dig it. That's a little, little bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but creative financing is like making payments back to the seller for a portion of the mortgage. And that's a way to leverage getting yourself into more expensive deals than most of the, like than you'd be able to get into if you had to come up with all the cash yourself. And so you'll learn all this stuff as you get into the real estate game. You're gonna improve your network, right? By talking about what you're doing and networking with people, going to local meetups, learning about real estate, you'll find people who are willing to lay, to raise money, to lend you money for your deals, which allows you to scale outside of needing bank financing. I probably bought 15 houses to, in the last year or two, well, no, about 13 houses two months ago, where somebody else lent all the money and we didn't put a dollar in, but we're renovating everything. We'll give him all his money back plus interest. But I'd probably bought 15 houses where other people funded it before that and I'd renovate them and then pay that person back. So th those are people who found me and trust me through all of these different methods of real estate investing and networking. Then you can land more deals. You can land bigger deals. You can land better deals and you're just slowly scaling. It's stacking upon itself. And then you're going for that financial freedom. So like, look, check this out. It took me a year and a half from the time I bought my first property to when I bought my second deal. It took me one year to buy my third. In the next year, I averaged four deals a month. Then we started going for bigger deals. And I've purchased three deals this year so far. So about a 130 unit hotel at the beginning of the year. And I, I'm a smaller owner. I own about 9% of that deal. There's a bunch of other people in the deal with me. But I bought a 130 unit hotel by leveraging networking and relationships. Then I bought a duplex. That's totally mine, by the way, zero down. And then I bought, and that's an investment property. I used some creative strategies to get to that point. And then I bought 13 single families in a vacant lot. Now, full transparency, I only own 35% of that. My buddy Marty owns 65% of that. Marty found the deal and he's doing all the work. I brought all the money partners into the deal. So it's a win-win. I'm doing almost nothing on that project project. Super cool. So you can start leveraging all these things. So as you see there, I bought, I mean, that's what 144, 145 units 
so far this year and I've spent very minimal time on it and very little capital expended. That being said, that's you know a seven and a half million dollar hotel that'll be worth 14 and the others are probably around a million dollars worth of houses. See, that's how I started. I scaled into my 10 unit. We talked about this a little bit. This was my second property. It took me a year and a half to get into this from my first property. Bought it for 212. I know you're not going to find a 10 unit for 212, but let me let me tell you, this was not a classy 10 unit, right? This was <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that needed work done on this on this 10 unit. Um, so it's not like this luxury condominium on the beach. This is Crapola 101, but $212,500. The bank lent $180,260. You can see it right there. From the seller, the seller let me pay that $21,250 back to them over time. So that's the seller financing we're talking about. So I, w I didn't have $32,000, $33,000 for the down payment to get into this house. So I talked to the seller. I only had to come up with $10,990, which, by the way, if you do the math, that 1.5 years, a large chunk of that was saved up over that time. In fact, I would, let's say, at least five grand, probably a little bit more, was just saved up from that. The rest was saved up from me being frugal enough to save some money. So the combination of those two things allowed me to get into this down this down payment, and it cash flowed seven fifty a month. So I basically paid eleven thousand dollars for seven fifty a month in my pocket. That's a really good return right there. That's, in fact, that's a. Uh, I don't want to do the math in public. It's like nine grand back year one. So it basically paid me back for itself out of my pocket expenses in 18 months. Here's the kicker. I sold it four years to the day later for 340. I netted $157,726. My cash flow was 36,000. I basically brought in just shy of $194,000 on this property. I owned it for four years. I already, I'm not going to read through all of that because I already broke down how I did the creative financing, but I brought in over a hundred percent of my money or almost a hundred percent of my money every single year for owning this property. Oh, so that's great. I know you're all like, Oh my God. Yay. But how do I find these deals? There's a lot of different ways and we could go on and on and on and on for hours, but this is the easiest way. It really boils down to this. Now you can go and you can look at, local investment Facebook groups and wholesalers and other investors and networking and all this other stuff. But if you're looking for the house hack deals to get started, this is what it boils down to. Find a good real estate agent, find a good VA lender. And this could be, you see my steps there, go to Yelp and search for best real estate agent near me. Don't look at the ones that are sponsored. Look at the non-sponsored reviews a little further down. Call and interview each one, ask them what they know about house hacking. You can ask local investors. You can go to local real estate investor associations, Facebook groups, the Bigger Pockets Forum. I don't recommend using a friend or family member unless they're actually like a full-time real estate agent and really successful because they might have your best interest at heart. They might be a friend or family member, but you know, it's like you <laughs> if your friend owns a rifle and you're trying to take out a terrorist, you're gonna go for the sniper, not the friend who owns a rifle just because it's a friend. Like you're gonna trust the professional. So do the same thing here. With a VA lender, you can search best VA lender near me. I wouldn't go through Veterans United, Navy Federal, USAA, or other big banks. They just, they're slower. They've got, they'll pass you from person to person. They'll add unnecessary fees in there because, and, and I mean, not always, but this is just my experience. They're just not great lenders, right? The Veterans United is the best marketing company in the world for VA loans. They're not the best lender. They're, they're quality. They'll pass you around. Everything's just subpar compared to like other lenders. You could call and interview whoever's left. You know, you could add other veterans in the area and ask who had good experiences or go to my website. So from military to millionaire.com, you know, you just Google military millionaire, whatever pops right up, go over there. You click the little button resources, click VA network, find a VA lender, right? It says recommended real estate agents or lenders in your area, totally free for you. And I told you guys, I'm full transparency here. If you go through this and you buy a house, I will get 25% of that agent's, that agent's commission, which is great. You won't pay that. You're buying the house. You don't pay a dollar. That's not, the seller will pay that. The seller will pay their agent. That agent will pay the other agent, your agent. And then that agent will pay me. So it'll cost you nothing to get 
the introduction to somebody who does this all the time. So for example, I've got a gentleman named Tobin in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, who's helped like 25 vets in the last few years within the military millionaire community. He's amazing. And his lender, I'm not gonna say guarantees because I can't guarantee it. Most of the time, his lender is able to actually get you money back at closing. So you will potentially walk away with money in your pocket when you close. Pretty sweet, the guy's a professional. He's who I would go to in a heartbeat if I moved there. I'd be happy to make that intro. Yes, I'll get a small piece if you use the house or use them, but that's just, I'm, I'm telling you all that out of transparency. It's a win-win. Everybody wins in this scenario and you don't pay a dollar. Well, you'll still pay closing costs and fees. Don't get that. Unless you get the 4% credit, which Tobin will fight for. So again, it's all a wash. The best thing that I could ever hope for for you is you buy your first house hack, $0 out of pocket, and you live for free and it crushes it. Here's an example. <clears throat> Of this working this is doug spence good friend of mine he's a navy uh, a navigator his wife there is a jag officer they're both in the navy they bought a single family house with an adu attached it's a basement unit they paid 965 the rent from their basement unit is 2150 so they're still out of pocket 2750 a month or 2700 dollars a month not living for free um they got an incredible interest rate on it and oh i thought there was another slide on him um and that property is probably worth 1.2 now. And so they're saving $2,000 a month that they would have been spending to live there. And between the two of their BAH, they more than pocket money every month. And this deal has been great for them. Rio Gallegos, this stud, he was on the original Silky Hike. If any of you are into the Silky Hike world, uh, he was one of the founders with Donnie O'Malley himself. I mean, no, I wouldn't say founders, but he was one of the very first people on the very first Silky Hike with Donnie O'Malley. It was a pretty funny YouTube video with them on it, getting interviewed. And uh, bought a single family house, five bedroom, four bath, bought it for 721. Current numbers shown right there are after he moved out. He currently lives in Japan. So now that he lives in Japan, he makes $7,100 a month, and he's all in for uh, math and public there, basically $5,700. So he's making like $1,400 a month. Now, he rented the master bath or the master bedroom, right, for $1,800. He was living in that before he moved to Japan. So he was out of pocket about $400 a month to live in the house, and now he's making $1,400 a month to live in Japan. But that's not the coolest part about this house. And I really should just post that picture of the house. Um, so he broke down all of his other monthly expenses there. So you can see some of those wouldn't even be payments. Like he wouldn't pay a gardener and housemaid $540 every every month if he was the only person living in that house. But because he isn't and he takes care of it for them. You know, so this house is gnarly. It's probably worth 1.2, 1.1, 1.2 now. So he's probably got about a half a million dollars worth of equity. He's getting paid to own it. He doesn't live in it. He's never had a vacancy for more than two weeks in the entire time he's owned it. He rents it the he rents by the room to staff and officer. He's a well, he's a major now. He was a captain at the time. Or sorry, he's a captain now. He's he might be a major now. He was a lieutenant at the time. Long story short, never had more than two week vacancy. Rents to staff and O. The garage is like a three car garage that they turned into a really gnarly home gym. They built a like they had a room that they turned into like a pool table room, like a billiards room. They knocked a wall out, put a full self serve like bar into the wall. Um, this was where we threw down on the Super Bowl party that year. Like his house is really, really nice. It's in a gated community right outside the back uh, gate for Camp Pendleton. And like, he's the house that I think of when I'm like, when I say you can't really do this and live in your dream house, then I'm like, well, actually Rio's probably nailed it. So it's definitely possible. We got Cesar Bustamante. This gentleman bought a triplex for 950 in Miami. Currently it brings in 7,600 a month. He makes, you know, off that plus whatever his expenses are, he probably makes about a thousand dollars a month off it. Bought a triplex. It's zoned for up to nine units. So he's planning to build a fourth unit this year, and then he's going to refi to lower rates when time comes, and he'll probably add additional units to it. This property is going to set him up for success. Here's the crazy thing: 1.1 market value. If he literally did nothing but make his mortgage payment, he would be a millionaire when he retired, and he'd be able to live for free because this property would bring in enough money to live on especially if he added some units, he pays off the mortgage. He's set for life, one property. That can change your entire life. My good friend, Marty Tyler, uh, don't tell him I <laughs> threw this picture up here. This is right before, this is the day before we hosted our first like in-person out-of-state event in Tampa, Florida. And this is uh, for the mastermind members. And 
this was we did like a final run through to make sure everything was good and then he was exhausted and i stole this picture posted in our facebook group it was like marty so excited to meet all of you today <laughs> and then yeah but he bought this place uh he built a single family house with a unit above the garage they are all in for two hundred twenty thousand dollars they lived in the unit above the garage and then built the other house and then once they finished that, they moved into the house, rented the unit of the garage. They rented it for $500 a month. They're all in, their p- pity is 1100. So he spends 600 bucks a month to live in a five bedroom house with his family. Not living for free, but pretty damn close. And then we got Alex Schlow. Alex is a physician in Colorado. He actually used the physician loan. So he still has his full VA entitlement. And he bought this house for 415. He Airbnb, so he dug a an egress like he dug a exit into the basement so that he could build a one bed one bath apartment underneath the house and has a separate entrance and then seasonal colorado springs airbnb is very seasonal so between 1800 and 3500 dollars but last year he cash flowed if you average it out across the entire year he cash flowed quite well and he's living for free with his family so Hopefully now you can see how simple the path to wealth is, right? Like it's really not that complex. You do this, you save money, you invest that money. You do that over time, it compounds. Then you take on bigger deals. You take on, you know, you invest more in deals. It it just, it takes on a life of its own. There's some unique opportunities for service members, right? We've got the VA loan. We've got BAH, which I know it's not a perfect system, but it's better than not having BAH because you get that it's a non-taxed, you know, allotment. So it's awesome. We get frequent frequent, bleh, frequent relocations. So every time you PCS, you can do this again if you play your cards right. Um, and you can own multiple properties in multiple locations. You can get a taste for an expensive market, an affordable market, and whatever. Um, military tenants. You know as well as I do, E3s and E5s are not always the best tenants, but they're better than most. Like I would still bet on a military tenant over a non-military tenant almost every day. So if you're near base, you're going to get some good quality tenants. Um, I always joke that we're used to harsh living conditions, right? If you deployed a lot or you live in the field or whatever, or you've been in the barracks for five years, like who cares about house hacking a duplex? It's not uncomfortable for us at all. Like it's way more comfortable than what you're used used to. So it's great. Now the deployment hack is an awesome hack. So I love this. Let's say you buy a fourplex, you live in one unit, you rent the others. And six months later, your command's like, yo, you're going to Afghanistan or wherever, Syria, um, Kuwait, I don't know. You're like, oh, shoot. Well, you could either leave all your stuff in that unit and go, or you could move all your stuff in that unit into a storage unit for like a hundred bucks a month and then rent the fourth unit out because you're not living there for the next year. So you rent it out and then you, when you move back, you kick that person out and you move back into the house. Or if you've met all the occupancy requirements and you've got enough time left there, you could leave that one rented and buy another fourplex. And by doing that, you're basically putting your stuff in storage, renting the whole thing out and cash flowing while you're deployed. It's awesome. And then this is a little bit more complex, but the section 121 exclusion effectively means with any house you buy in real estate, if you live in it for 24 months out of the last five years, you can pay You can sell it without paying capital gains tax. So if the property goes up in value and you sell it for more, you're going to pay tax on it unless you lived in it for two years out of the last five. Now that could be like one year on, one year off, one year on, two years off. As long as you meet that two out of the last five requirement, you know, you're good. With service members, it's two in the last 15. So if you bought it while active duty and you sell it within uh, three years of leaving active duty, you can sell that house, one house, free of capital gains tax. You can't do this like a million times. It's one time. Um, up to $250,000 if you're single and a half a million dollars if you're married that you can not pay tax on. So a buddy of mine bought a house in North Park, San Diego County in 2014, sold it a year and a half ago, netted $517,000 and he only had to pay taxes on 17 grand because he's married. Now that's more than five years and he hadn't lived in it for the last five so had he not been in the military, he would have been screwed. But because he was, you get up to 15 years and he saved over six figures in taxes. Okay, so let's recap. This is what we can do that no one else could do. You get zero down, right? That's awesome. Up to 4% back in seller credit. Also awesome. No PMI. Saves you a lot of money every month. You get to use your VA loan more than once. If you play your cards right, you can use it quite a few times. 
you're going to get the funding fee wrapped in, which is way lower origination fees, way better. You've got access to the VA Earl. So when rates finally do drop, if you bought now, you can refinance all of those rates lower and save yourself money. So I, I tried to find a way to like calculate. There's no way because if you bought a hundred thousand dollar house or a million dollar house, you bought in this state or that state, all the taxes are different. It's all messed up. But over time, using the VA loan will literally save you tens of thousands of dollars per house. And it's awesome. Again, no one else has these opportunities. This is just service members and vets. This is very unique for us. We have an edge. You have an advantage. Military benefits are fucking sweet. Okay, so do me a favor. I'm gonna check the chat. Drop a drop me an ura or hua or whatever you guys say or ua dua dua dua, whatever. And oh, I see a comment there from Yanel, organize the first Vegas Silky hike. Woo! William, you don't need to join anything to get advice on local real estate agents. You just go click that button. I don't charge anything for that. All right, so let's see some. I got some uras. Cool, we're caught up here. There is like a 20, 30 second lag. Shaboopy. Yeah, shaboopy. All right, Carlos. Yeah, we can be friends. All right. Now, for those of you who need more support to cheat code, right? Everybody's like, what's in it for me? Oh my gosh, their money, blah, blah, blah. Look, check it out. You don't need me. You don't need anyone. You can do all of this on your own. I'm tired of, I see all these gurus online that are trying to sell you a load of shit and they suck and you can see my Instagram. I talk shit about them all. I make fun of them all. All the information's out there. You won't go as fast and you might make some mistakes. I made too many mistakes doing this all myself. So for those of you who do want to learn from my mistakes, learn from the mistakes of others and have a, a better chance at getting this right the first time. And trust me, the mistakes I avoided made me a lot more money than the mistakes or than the, the, the like me not knowing what to do and taking it slow wasn't where I lost my money. It was going too fast and thinking I could do it without asking people questions that just totally, totally screwed me. Um, I mean, like, six figures on one deal. Whoops. 30 grand on another deal. Whoops. Shouldn't have known, should have known better. So all that being said, look, my team's going to offer a free 45 minute investing game plan and strategy call, right? So you don't have to take this. I, I'm not like, I want you to set yourself up for success. If you want some more information, you want us to help point you in the right direction and you want help in going that direction. My team, it probably won't be me. I'm going to take some of these calls. But there's 238 of you still on this call. I can't handle that many phone calls. That's why I do like a big webinar where I get to talk to all of you and I'm gonna go through the Q&A in a minute and answer a bunch of questions. But I've got my my right hand man, Caleb, will be on taking some of these calls. We got another member of the team who might step in depending on how much we overflow, but you'll most likely get me or Caleb, probably Caleb, let's be real. Um, but 45 minutes, you sign up for a call, hop on a call. You can click that link right there. Let me drop this real quick so you can just Boom, you can just click that button to sign yourself up for a call. You can scan the QR code, whatever. But you should see the offer now. Sign up, I encourage you. And this is what we're gonna cover on the call. We're gonna talk about your long-term investment goals, right? Because we, everybody's different. Some people wanna be super involved in their business and make oodles of money and like just buy Lamborghinis. And other people are like, dude, I wanna make enough to live. And then I wanna go chill on a fucking beach and like drink Mai Tais and not work. Like everybody's different. We're gonna talk about what works best for you after house hacking, right? House hacking is amazing for getting started, but there's a lot of different strategies after that. You can do Airbnb, multifamily, self storage, RV parks, mobile home parks, whatever. Talk about different funding opportunities. How to look for those properties, what kind of properties, how much you're gonna to need to invest, what locations, right? If you wanna look for in-state, out-of-state, you know, there's, I bought a ton of real estate out-of-state. I've bought a ton of real estate in-state. Personally, I think in-state's a little easier. That being said, I made a ton of money buying stuff out of state too. So look, if the end, if you get to the end of this and you still want more help, then we'll talk to you about the real, the war room. Now, it, it's not gonna be the right fit for everybody. That's fine. I'll tell you a little bit. The war room is this, because people are gonna be asking the community. We are a community focused on helping service members and vets. There is a ton of education in there, but we focus on the community. We focus on helping brothers and sisters in arms out and answering questions and holding you all accountable and helping you really push your limits to achieve financial success. All the education's there, but you can also go buy some course from a guru and get the education. And then they'll have some like afterthought kind of half-assed community of whoever's left over that really doesn't help you. We built the community, the education's there. I'd rather you get the community and have the education if you want it, than get force fed the education that you can go find online 
and not really have the ability to ask questions. Like I literally take a call every single week in this group for an hour, one to many, you know, how many people show up direct mentorship. Sometimes it's me and two other people on the call and we just talk for an hour. Sometimes it's me and 10 people on the call. You bring all your questions, we help you through it. So the war room's phenomenal if that's what you decide is a good fit for you. So again, oh, there's my my question. And we'll get to the questions, but the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. I always joke that that's probably something that somebody who asked a lot of dumb questions said. But I'll leave this up so you can have all the info and see the thingy and then the offer. But let's jump in some Q&A here. Okay, first one right off the bat, Alfred. And I want to say Schlegel. Al Alfred asked, have you ever used someone else's VA loan and partnered up on a VA on a property? I have not. No. Two of my best friends did. They actually, we came up with the strategy while they were barbecuing in my backyard in Oceanside, California, and it made them $350,000 in two years. Donnie made a ton of money, had already, or, or sorry, made a ton of money, but he was a real estate agent. His income, because he was a new real estate agent, he couldn't count his income because it was commission based and it hadn't been two years. And it's just kind of a weird, like the way his income came in was weird. So he made a ton of money, had his full VA loan entitlement, but he couldn't buy a house. Adit had no VA loan entitlement because he'd already used it, but made a ton of money, had a job, could show the income. So they used Donnie's VA loan entitlement, Adit's income, qualified for a triplex together in San Diego. Uh, I believe that was in Imperial Beach. Bought the triplex, lived in it for two years, sold it, made him $350,000 in all. Pretty sick. Ooh, Nathan, why did I solicit people with at least 10K for joining today? Woohoo, we getting spicy. All right, check it out. Um, I don't know, it was a number I made up because I thought to myself, man, if I had not a dollar to my name when I first tried to get into real estate, which I didn't, it'd be really hard. Boy, I wish I'd had 10 grand because the reality is like, there are going to be some costs, whether it's marketing or whether it's, you know, I don't know, networking, going to dinner, whatever. Like I, I don't sell any for th anything for 10 grand. That's not why I picked 10 grand. I, it, it is what it is. Just a number I pulled out of thin air because I was like, eh, if they've been smart enough to save a little bit of money, they're probably a little bit more uh, along, like further along in the, like actually taking action. So let's see here. You can, you have to occupy the VA loan house as your primary residence. There are other ways to buy an out of state house. Can't be the VA loan unless you're gonna occupy it within 60 days of buying it. Vijay, I don't know if I'll be able to get you a copy of the slides, potentially. I think logistically that might be a nightmare, um, but there will be a replay of the webinar coming out and that'll have it. You can just click through, you know, um, pause the video, wherever. I'll see what I can do to, if you hit me up on Instagram, I might be able to get you the slides. Um, but you know, 50 people message me about the slides and would be like, just watch the replay. Um, Rodney, you cannot use the VA loan to purchase anything over four units, but you can use it as a stepping stone for getting further along to be able to buy the hundred units. Most people, when they buy a hundred unit uh, apartment complex, they're raising money from other people. They're not even using an actual mortgage. They use like bank financing. A lot of it's non-recourse debt. It's a totally different ball game. Yeah, William, we, I think we talked about that. You have to have either two years of landlord experience. It's actually what it says is, a reasonable chance of succeeding. Anyone who tells you two years of landlord experience, that's a lender making that decision. That's not the VA. The VA doesn't give a shit. Um, or property management, right? So yeah, you just tell them you're hiring a property manager if that lender has that issue. The lenders that I recommend, like if you click my link, they don't care. They won't make you have that proof. Justin, you can use the VA loan for a construction loan. Yes, you can buy, uh, you can do a one-time close. You can buy a house or buy land and build a house on it with the VA loan. You can't buy like, I don't know anyone who does like multifamily stuff that way, but you can build a single family and there might be a way to do multi. Trey, uh, I, I don't want to get into the verification for occupying the home. Look, here's the deal. It's, it's a, it's a risk reward thing. Is it guaranteed that the VA is going to find out if you buy a house and never occupy it? No, but if they do find out it's a $10,000 fine and up to five years in jail or up to 10 years in jail, it's a felony. Is it worth buying a house for a little bit of money out of pocket or for less money out of pocket that you're not planning to live in, is that worth potentially not being able to vote or go on your kid's school or carry a gun and like spending time in jail? No, absolutely not. There's not a house in the world that I would risk that for. So are they going to show up at your house? I don't know. They do catch people. It's not a risk that I would say is worth it. Just, just plan to occupy the home. Um, 
Troy, I believe I already answered that by showing you where to find that link for the lenders. Uh, so, hey, Jesus, you can join the Military Millionaire Facebook group, and we discuss that stuff as well. The War Room is my more high-level like mastermind for people who are super serious about it. Um, I, I can't guarantee how soon you see a financial benefit. That's on you, right? Like, it It's going to be dependent on how fast you take action. I'll tell you, I did a poll in the group last year, and over 70% of the group said that they'd seen a 10x plus, or over 50% of the group said they'd seen a 10x plus return on their investment. And I think it was like over 80% of the group had seen at least 2x return, right? So yeah, I, I could break that down a little bit more. But so Mr. Philip, credit score do you have to have? The VA loan actually doesn't have a minimum requirement. Any lender who tells you otherwise is their own overlay. That being said, most lenders are going to have an overlay. I would say if you're at 640 or above, you're totally fine. 580 or above, you're probably fine. The lowest I've seen a lender go is 520. Most lenders won't go that low, but I've seen someone buy a VA, a house with a VA loan with a 520 credit score. That being said, it's not as hard as you think to get your credit raised. So, you know, if that's an issue, we can help talking about that. Oh, I missed this one. She's probably already gone, but Laura, yes, this you'll get the replay on this. Um, no, the VA loan is not one-time use. It can be used multiple times as we talked about, but it does have to be your primary residence. Uh, Jason, you have to purchase the house in your own name if you're doing the VA loan. Woo. It can't be purchased in an LLC. It has to be purchased in your own name. That being said, I've got an article on my blog that digs into this. You really don't need an LLC for that first one. Uh, you can't buy an RV park for with a VA loan. That's an investment property. You'd have to go through a bank buy for a di different one. Ooh, Logan, that's a good question. Can you use a VA loan for property or a boat dock? I, I want to say the answer would be if the boat dock comes with the house, yes, but I don't think you could just specifically buy a boat dock with a VA loan. Um, if you want more specifics on that, shoot me a message on Instagram and I'd love to, that kind of excites me because I don't know that answer and I'll dig in, I'll ask my letters. All right, guys, I got about 10 minutes left. So let's see here. I got, uh, you do have to occupy full time and you have to meet the occupancy requirements. You have to intend to occupy it for a reasonable amount of time. Most banks will say a year. That if, if situations change, that's fine. Like if you buy a house six months later, you have orders and you move, nobody cares. You just can't buy it knowing you're going to move out in like two months and never planning to actually occupy it. This all goes back to your intent. Ruben, I would check out that blog post. Just go to my blog and type, do you need an LLC? That's from militarymillionaire.com. If you just type in, do I need an LLC? Uh, it'll pop right up. I wrote a really good article about this. I don't think you need it on your first property or two, but when you start investing in properties you don't live in, yes. Uh, junior, yeah. You know, best place to look for rental properties I've got an article on that too. If you type in and you go to the blog and you type in uh, best real estate markets or best market to invest in, um, or just real estate market, uh, you'll be able to find that article. California, it's a love hate. It's a, California is like an appreciation play. You're you're banking on the market going up over time, whereas like Missouri is more of a cash flow game where you're making a little bit of money and it won't go up as much. Lafayette, that would be a question about with your your child occupying the house. Um, you would need to talk to a lender depending on the specific situation i think it's possible but it's not like a one size fits all so you'd want to talk with the lender specifically about your situation yeah you can't live in every property this is just a, the, the house hacking is just a starting out strategy you buy a house a year or two later you buy another one and then it gives you the momentum to buy a whole lot of other properties like by living in this house and house hacking with the airbnb i'm saving 2600 dollars a month that i am investing like that 2,600 bucks a month pays for a full-time employee for me. Well, pays for two part-time employees for me. <laughs> um, my full-time employees about double that, but Ooh, Steven, it would be a good idea to add VA approved builders, contractors to my website. Can you, if you shoot me a message on Instagram, I'd love to pick your brain about that. Um, I'm always a down to add value to people. Uh, so I'd love to hear more about that. Larry, you don't need to join the war room to get advice on local real estate. Let's just go click that uh, button on my website and we'll hook you up for free. How do you purchase real estate? It isn't your primary residence without putting 20% down. Creative financing, so seller financing. Um, partnerships, right? You can partner with someone who has the money and you bring all the work. Uh, you can also raise it from a private lender. So these are all a little bit more complex strategies. You can do subject to, um, you can do, those are all a little bit more complex, but there are several different ways to buy zero down with or, or less than 20% down. Also like my lender, my lender only needs 15% down. Um, so those are all different ways that we kind of dig into as we go. Uh, 
Yeah, dude. Nick, I would say if you can get into wrenching out the pilots, that'd be killer. I think it's a great market. Uh, the requirement for getting rid of capital gains tax is if you're not active duty, you have to have occupied it as your primary residence for 24 months cumulative, like total, out of the last five years. And if you are active duty, it's out of the last 15 years. I gotta be some oohahs and hoo-ahs. Jeff, I would say if you go to my blog, and the reason I'm deferring y'all to my blog is I wrote really detailed answers in a lot of this, which is just way better than I can give you right now. Um, or you can read my book. It's got all of this in there too. You can get a free copy of that, but the blog is probably easier for your specific questions. But Jeff, how do you find a property manager and how much does one typically cost? That article will have a list of 20 questions that I would recommend you ask when interviewing property managers to find the right one. And it'll kind of outline what you want to look for, like what fees you should pay, what fees you shouldn't pay. Typically, they're going to cost you between 8 and 12% of whatever the rent is. Currently, because I brought a lot of properties to mine, I pay 7%. So if I bring in $100,000 in rent, I pay her 7 The 93 covers the rest of my expenses and I pocket the difference. Um, but that's, that's going to depend. Uh, what website can you go to to find multiplexes? Really, you're going to want to look at the MLS, which is why you're going to want to get with an agent. You can use Zillow, Realtor.com. There is a website called PropStream. If you want information on that, shoot me a message. Happy to send you a link. It is not free. It's like $97 a month, but it allows you to search specific, like get really nitty gritty on what you're looking for. So you can literally be like, I want a fourplex that was built in this year. The owner doesn't live in the house anymore. So he's a landlord and he just got divorced. Like you can really dive in on tax records and get very specific. It's kind of scary, but, um, you don't need to do that. You can just go find a real estate agent, use the, use their MLS access, uh, which is the website all agents use for properties and ask them to help you find those. Um, Amy, uh, the reason I haven't mentioned the name of my lender is because I go through a community called Vetted VA and they train brokers. And so it's any number, like they can go, they can go and search through a hundred different lenders for you and pick whichever one fits your situation the best for rate or for, you know, a construction loan or a renovation loan or whatever. Um, and they're trained by a good friend of mine and they're very, 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 very knowledgeable. Um, so it's not a specific lender. It's uh, they're brokers. I'm glad that one of you laughed about me saying I'd get too many calls. I couldn't handle them all. If you lose in your house for six years. Oh, if you, if you want to, yeah, you could refi your house. Oh, if you lived in it for six, yeah, you could move out and buy a duplex or yeah. Um, oh, San Antonio. Amy, if you shoot me a message, one of my good friends, Megan Worth, lives in San Antonio. She's a real estate agent. She's a stud. I would be happy to introduce you to her. She's she's a happy human. No, you can get you can have more than one VA loan out of the time, Chris. Jason, I would absolutely recommend trying to house hack in Austin, Texas. I love this question. Same thing I just told Amy. If you want to shoot me a message or if you fill out the, the little questionnaire there, one of my best friends. I, I kid you not, I went to five different states with this dude last year. Like we were in Maui together. We were in Maine. We were in Tahoe. Love this guy, Diego Corzo. He's a freaking stud. He lives in Austin. He literally, the first t-shirt he ever gave me said house hacking club. He is the king of house hacking. He still, I think he still lives in a duplex. He just bought his own condo in Puerto Rico. He owns, he probably owns 20 houses in Austin. Happy to make that intro. Love that guy. He'll take care of you. Telling you, the agents I pick on my list are studs. Like, I, I pick winners um, because I don't want to recommend someone to you who sucks because then you're going to be like, wow, this dude sucks. You must suck, Dave. <laughs> I'd rather you be like, holy shit, that agent was amazing. Thanks for the introduction. Damn right. Um, all right, guys, I'm trying to pick one or two out here because I got to run to the bathroom and I got to go pick up my kid. Oh my gosh, Andy. Oh no. I see two comments about this. Guys, this is good and bad. Good and bad, good and bad. It says you're unable to schedule an appointment. There are no available call times for next week. Holy shit. <laughs> I'll end on this because that just made my night. That's that's not good. Um, we will fix that. Um, okay, here's what I want from you guys. Um, keep that link saved. You'll get an email reminder tomorrow. Try again tomorrow. So <laughs> that means that you already filled every single spot on my calendar and Caleb's calendar for the next week. So holy crap. That's never happened before. Um, if you're unable to schedule for the next week, oh my gosh, that's a lot of slots. Um, I'm going to have a busy week and so is Caleb. Probably Caleb more than I, but um, <laughs> I love that. That just, that just made me smile. I'm glad you guys got some value out of this. So for those of you who are trying to schedule a call right now and you can't, um, we've never broken that system before and I love it. That makes me happy. I'm so glad that you guys got something out of this call. Do this for me. 
give me a chance tomorrow and try to schedule again. If it still says the same thing, well, then I didn't fix it fast enough and shoot me an email or, or an Instagram DM. We will get you on a call. I promise we will find a way to get you all on a call. It just might be a little bit delayed if there's not enough hours in the day. Um, but we will, we will see whatever we got to do. I, this is awesome. I freaking love you guys. Ugh, if it says all of July is booked. Okay. We probably don't have July open yet on the calendar. So that's probably why it looks like July is booked. He probably just didn't want to open that far out. You guys are amazing. I love you all. This has been super, super, super cool. Um, Kathy, go away with that. I don't, why, why are you, why, yeah, we are a no pitch zone. Get out of here. If you want to be a, one of the eight, Hey, Kathy, check this out. If you want to be one of the agents on my recommended list, hit me up. We'll talk. I'll run you through some questions. If you meet my criteria, I would be happy to help and happy to put you on the list and pitch you up against some of my other Georgia agents, but please don't come back into one of my calls and pitch your own business. This is, this is, uh, I'm trying to value add here. I have no way to know if you're a real solid agent. Sorry. I mean, you might be the best agent in the world. I just don't know. So I can't vouch for you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. My Instagram. Instagram is at from military to millionaire. You should follow along. And honestly, if you guys aren't yet, you should absolutely jump in our Facebook group. We've got a free Facebook group. It's you just go to Facebook and type military millionaire. It's got 67,000 people in it and there's so much value in there. It's awesome. So I recommend you join the Facebook group. That one's totally free. It's got tons of value, tons of, you can ask questions there and also hop on the Instagram. Um, but I got to run or I'm going to be late and uh, you guys are amazing. Have a great night.